You all mind if I kiss the bridegroom? Not at all. <laughs> there. <laughs> Standing on Hollywood's zenith were very talented and crafty personalities whose name still echoes in the Hall of Fame. Randolph Scott was no exception on this list because even an unborn child grinned at his comic antics. I'll be right back. What? Uh, no matches, see? No matches. <laughs> From his captivating on-screen presence to his lesser-known ventures, Scott always stole the show. While the universe missed the presence of this powerful actor, there arose a hidden cockroach in the cupboard. This secret will make you shudder. Are you ready for it? Let's get started. Who is he? George Randolph Scott is an American film actor who made a lasting impact on Hollywood from 1928 to 1962. Throughout his career, he played a wide range of roles in various film genres, including social dramas, crime dramas, comedies, musicals, although he didn't sing or dance, adventure tales, war films, and even a few horror and fantasy movies. But it's his portrayal of the tall-in-the-saddle Western hero that truly stands the test of time. Out of the incredible over 100 films he graced with his presence, more than 60 of them were Westerns. In fact, according to editor Edward Boscombe, when you think of the Western genre, George Scott's name instantly comes to mind. He was closely identified with the rugged charm and bravery that epitomized the Wild West. Standing at an impressive six feet two inches in height, George Scott was not only tall, but also possessed a lanky, muscular frame and striking good looks. In his early film appearances, he showcased his natural charm and spoke with a delightful southern drawl, which helped offset any initial stiffness or clumsiness he may have had on screen. As time went on, Scott's acting skills evolved and improved, and his performances became more polished and rugged. He effortlessly embodied the strong, silent type of stoic hero, with a burnished and leathery appearance that added to his allure. So, whether it was a thrilling western or any other genre, George Randolph Scott left an indelible mark on the silver screen, capturing hearts and imaginations with his easygoing charm, southern drawl, and unforgettable portrayals of heroes we all admired. Early Days George Randolph Scott was born on January 23, 1898, in Orange County, Virginia, had a beautiful background. Raised in Charlotte, North Carolina, he was the second of six children in a family of Scottish descent. His father, George Grant Scott, was the first certified public accountant, CPA, in North Carolina, and his mother, Lucille Crane Scott, came from a wealthy North Carolina family. Growing up in a financially stable household, Scott had the privilege of attending private schools like Woodbury Forest School. It was during his early years that he discovered and showcased his athletic abilities. He excelled in various sports, including football, baseball, horse racing, and swimming. When the United States entered World War I in April 1917, Scott joined the North Carolina National Guard in July. He received training as an artillery observer and quickly rose in rank, becoming a corporal in October of the same year and a sergeant in February 1918. In May, he entered active duty at Fort Monroe, Virginia, as part of the 2nd Trench Mortar Battalion. The battalion was deployed to France, where they participated in combat with the U.S. Four Corps. After the armistice in November 1918, Scott's battalion took part in the post-war occupation of Germany as part of the U.S. Four Corps. Following his service, he attended the Artillery Officer Candidate School in Saumur, where he received his commission as a second lieutenant of field artillery in May 1919. Scott returned to the United States, arriving in New York City on June 6 of the same year, and there, he received an honorable discharge on June 13th. Scott's military experience greatly influenced his acting career. His training in horsemanship and firearm use during the war became valuable assets in his later roles. After World War I, Scott pursued his education at Georgia Tech, aiming to become an All-American football player. Unfortunately, a back injury prevented him from achieving that goal. He then transferred to the University of North Carolina, where he studied textile engineering and manufacturing. However, he eventually dropped out and joined the textile firm where his father worked as an accountant. While all these career switches happened in Scott's life, little did he know that his next chapter would lead him to become a legendary figure in Hollywood's golden age. Career Randolph Scott developed an interest in acting in 1927 and moved to Los Angeles to pursue a career in the motion picture industry. His father provided him with a letter of introduction to Howard Hughes, which led to Scott getting a small part in the George O'Brien film Sharpshooters in 1928. In the following years, 
Scott worked as an extra and bit player in several films, including Weary River and The Virginian, among others. He also appeared uncredited in films like Dynamite, 1929, and Born Reckless, 1930. During this time, Scott gained acting experience by performing in stage plays at the Pasadena Playhouse. He appeared in plays such as Gentlemen Be Seated, Nellie the Beautiful Model, William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, and George Bernard Shaw's Man and Superman. In 1931, Scott played his first leading role in the film Women, Men, Marry, followed by a supporting part in A Successful Calamity. In 1932, he then signed a seven-year contract with Paramount Pictures and made his debut under the contract in the comedy Sky Bride. His first significant starring role came in Heritage of the Desert in 1932, a Western film that established him as a Western hero. He went on to make several Western films based on the novels of Zane Grey, including The Thundering Herd and Man of the Forest. In addition to his work in Westerns, Scott also appeared in non-Western roles, such as Hot Saturday in 1932 and Hello Everybody in the following year. He had a versatile career, alternating between westerns, romantic comedies, horror movies, and other genres. The Zane Grey series of films provided Scott with valuable experience in both action and acting, and they were considered to be uniformly good. They served as a training ground for him and helped establish his reputation as a capable actor in the industry. During this period, Randolph Scott worked with various studios and appeared in a range of films. After finishing his contract with Paramount, he signed a deal with 20th Century Fox. He was cast in movies such as Jesse James and Susanna of the Mounties in the year 1939, both of which featured him alongside Shirley Temple. He also starred in Frontier Marshall in 1939 and 20,000 Men a Year still the same year. Scott then moved to Warner Brothers and played a Confederate officer in Virginia City in 1940, alongside Errol Flynn and Humphrey Bogart. He returned to RKO to star in My Favorite Wife in 1940, a romantic comedy with Irene Dunn and Cary Grant. He also appeared in When the Daltons Rode with Kay Francis. In 1940, Scott starred in Western Union, a Technicolor production directed by Fritz Lang and co-starring Robert Young. He received critical acclaim for his performance in this film. He continued to work in westerns, appearing in Bell Star in 1941 with Gene Tierney and The Spoilers, in 1942 with Marlene Dietrich and John Wayne. In addition to his film work, Scott made cameo appearances in Follow the Boys, 1944, and starred in Bell of the Yukon, 1944, alongside Gypsy Rose Lee. He also performed on radio shows such as Screen Guild Players and Old Gold Comedy Theater in 1945. Towards the end of Randolph Scott's career, he ventured into non-Western genres, showcasing his versatility as an actor. In 1947, he starred in Home Sweet Homicide, a mystery film alongside Peggy Ann Garner at Fox. He also appeared in Christmas Eve, a family drama produced by Bogos. Scott had a cameo role in Warner Brother, Starlift, in 1951. Additionally, he collaborated with producer Nat Holt on several westerns. They worked together on films such as Bad Man's Territory and Trail Street in 1946 and 1947, respectively. Their partnership continued with movies like Return of the Bad Men, Canadian Pacific, Fighting Man of the Plains, and The Caribou Trail in 1950. Another significant collaboration in Scott's career was with producer Harry Joe Brown at Columbia. They teamed up for the Western film Gunfighters in 1947, marking the beginning of a fruitful partnership. Together, they produced several Westerns, including Coroner Creek, 1948, and The Walking Hills, 1949, the latter directed by John Sturgis. A significant turning point in Scott's career came when screenwriter Burt Kennedy wrote the script for Seven Men From Now, in 1955, originally intended for John Wayne, Wayne suggested Scott as his replacement due to scheduling conflicts. The film, released in 1956, became a critical success and marked the beginning of Scott's collaboration with director Bud Bettacher. Together, they worked on seven films, often referred to as The Renown Cycle, named after Scott and Harry Joe Brown's production company. These Boetitcher Scott collaborations were known for their beautiful cinematography, precise structure, and use of the California Sierra's landscape. Scott portrayed a hero with a quiet, stoical sense of humor, facing off against charming villains played by actors like Richard Boone and Claude Akins. The films in the Ranown cycle included The Tall T, 1957, Decision at Sundown, 1957, Buchanan Rides Alone, 
1958, Ride Lonesome, 1959, and Comanche Station in the year 1960. Although Westbound, 1959, was directed by Boetacher, it is not considered part of the official cycle. Randolph Scott's final film appearance was in Ride the High Country, 1962, directed by Sam Peckinpah. In this western, Scott starred alongside Joel McCree, another actor known for his western roles. The film evoked a sense of nostalgia for the Old West, explored themes of male bonding and the generation gap, and featured compelling antagonists in the form of the Hammonds. While Scott and McCree's roles were relatively balanced, Scott received top billing after a coin toss favored him. Ride the High Country served as a fitting farewell to both actors' careers and left a lasting impression on audiences. Personal Life and Controversial Rumor Did you know that the personal lives of most celebrities are not far from shady secrets? Let's get into the intriguing personal life of Randolph Scott, the renowned actor on the silver screen. With two marriages, close friendships with Hollywood legends, and rumors that have swirled for decades, his story is filled with fascinating details. In 1936, Scott started his first marriage to Marion DuPont, an heiress whose family legacy traced back to the founder of E.I. DuPont de Nemours and Company. Marion had previously been married to George Somerville, and interestingly, Scott had the honor of serving as the best man at their wedding. However, after three years, their marriage came to an end, and they went their separate ways. Despite the divorce, Marion chose to retain Scott's last name for nearly five decades until her passing in 1983. It showed the impact he had on her life. In 1944, Scott found love again when he married Patricia Stillman, an actress who was 21 years his junior. This union brought joy and fulfillment to their lives, and in 1950, they expanded their family through adoption, welcoming two children named Sandra and Christopher. Parenthood added a new dimension to Scott's life, and he embraced his role as a father with love and dedication. While Scott's on-screen fame continued to rise, he managed to keep a relatively low profile when it came to his private life. However, behind the scenes, he formed strong friendships with some of Hollywood's biggest names, including Fred Astaire and Cary Grant. It was his connection with Grant that particularly captured public attention. Scott and Grant first met on the set of Hot Saturday in 1932, and their bond grew so close that they decided to live together in a beach house in Malibu, which affectionately became known as Bachelor Hall. Now here's where the story takes an intriguing turn. Rumors have persisted for years, suggesting that Scott and Grant had a romantic relationship during their time together at Bachelor Hall. While both men, their wives, and their families vehemently denied these rumors, whispers of a secret love affair continued to swirl. Two individuals, Richard Blackwell, an actor at RKO, and photographer Jerome Zerb, claimed to have had intimate encounters with the pair. Blackwell detailed in his autobiography that Grant and Scott were deeply, madly in love, and that their devotion to each other was unbreakable. However, it's crucial to remember that personal relationships are complex, and the truth about Scott and Grant's connection may forever remain a mystery. In 1944, Scott and Grant decided to part ways as roommates, but their friendship endured until the end of their lives. Their bond was a testament to the profound connection they shared, whether romantic or not. It's a reminder that relationships can evolve and change over time, yet still retain a deep sense of kinship. The studio, however, grew concerned about the rumors because being perceived as gay could lead to being blacklisted in Hollywood. So, to counter these rumors, Cary Grant, who was forced by the studio to get married, would tell his girlfriend, Marin Donaldson, that they loved the fact that people thought they were gay. The studio even encouraged them to have women over, thinking it would dispel the rumors. It seems they became quite the playboys, enjoying the company of friends of all genders. Now, some individuals like Mr. Blackwell, a notable figure in the fashion world, claimed that Randolph and Carrie were a couple behind closed doors and deeply in love. But Randolph Scott's son has come forward and expressed his disbelief in those claims. Marin Donaldson, too, never believed it, as Carrie never led her to think that way. Yet. There were reports from people like Scotty Bowers, known as the Hollywood pimp to the stars, who claimed that both Randolph and Carrie visited him. There's even a story from a book where the maitre d' of the Beverly Hillcrest Hotel mentioned that when Randolph and Carrie were in their 70s, they came in for dinner and, once everyone had left, they were holding hands. Whether these accounts are true or not, it's none of our business. What's evident is that they were extremely close throughout their lives. As the years have passed, several men have come forward, sharing stories of their queer encounters with Grant and Scott. 
and there were even more folks who believed they witnessed a deep romantic love between the two. On the other hand, some people who knew them insisted it was nothing more than a close friendship. It's a real puzzle, dear friend, because understanding the complexities of closeted gay life in pre-World War II, America is like navigating a maze. Here's the thing though, no matter how much we debate whether they were gay, bi, or straight, or who saw what and when, it doesn't capture the essence of what Grant and Scott meant to each other. It fails to grasp how their relationship shaped their private lives and their careers in the glitzy world of Hollywood. In fact, there's an account from someone who knew them that quotes Grant calling Scott the love of his life. Now that's something. Previous attempts to shed light on their relationship focused on cheeky magazine photos and attention-grabbing headlines, rather than delving into what was publicly known and disclosed at the time. But when you dig into the intimate details of those articles and consider the testimonies of those who were close to Grant and Scott, a unique picture emerges. It's a picture of cohabitation, codependency, and quite possibly, love. At the very least, it was a deep and meaningful friendship. Now let's not forget about the studio they were both under contract with, Paramount. From the studio's perspective, they wanted to maintain the illusion that Grant and Scott were still single and available. They wanted the public to think these guys were living the bachelor life. But come on, living together for so long it's pretty hard to buy into that story. In one interview, Scott revealed that Grant lost sleep and weight over articles that invaded his personal life and thoughts. It's clear that their bond ran deep and had a profound effect on Grant. And if you need more proof, just check out those homoerotic coded photos that accompanied a Screenland piece. They captured Grant and Scott swimming together, sharing a meal, and even playing with a dog. Talk about a visual representation of their years-long partnership under the scrutiny of the media. We may never know the full truth, but what we do know is that their connection was something special. It defied societal norms and left an indelible mark on their lives. Love comes in all shapes and forms, and theirs was a bond that transcended labels and expectations. Gruesome Exits After retiring from his illustrious movie career, Cary Grant ventured into executive roles for companies like Fabergé, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, MGM, and Hollywood Park. He also spent his later years traveling the world, seeking new experiences. However, Grant's life was tragically cut short when he passed away from a stroke in 1986 at the age of 82. When Cary Grant passed away, Randolph Scott was devastated. Upon hearing the news, he broke down in tears, and within months, he passed away. Their bond was profound. Scott's life came to a close in 1987 due to heart and lung ailments. He was 89 years old at the time of his passing, leaving behind a legacy of remarkable acting achievements and an enigmatic personal life. Scott was laid to rest at Elmwood Cemetery in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he found his final resting place. His wife Patricia, who had stood by his side for 43 years, passed away in 2004 and was buried beside him. Sadly, their beloved mid-century modern home, which held countless memories, was torn down in 2008. However, Scott's legacy lives on through the preservation of his papers, including photos, scrapbooks, notes, letters, articles, and house plans. These invaluable artifacts were entrusted to the UCLA Library Special Collection, ensuring that future generations can continue to explore and appreciate the life of this remarkable actor. Aftermath Legacy Randolph Scott, the iconic actor, left quite a mark on popular culture, even beyond his film career. Let's take a look at some fascinating references and tributes to this Hollywood legend. In 1960, Scott's face reportedly served as the model for the Oakland Raiders logo, which underwent minor modifications, but remained consistent with the original design for over 50 years. It's incredible to think that his image was associated with such an iconic sports team. In Thomas Pynchon's 1963 novel Five, the character Profane watches a Randolph Scott film and compares himself unfavorably to the cool and composed hero. Profane admires Scott's ability to keep his mouth shut and only speak when necessary, saying the right things, a true embodiment of charisma. The 1963 film Soldier in the Rain features a character, Bobby Joe Pepperdine, who exclaims that Jackie Gleason's character is, just like Randolph Scott on the late, late movies, a fat Randolph Scott. This comparison reveals how Scott's on-screen presence became synonymous with a certain type of character, admired for their strength and bravery. Randolph Scott's name also found its way into popular songs. Tom Lehrer's 1965 song Send the Marines mentions John Wayne and Randolph Scott as symbols of American toughness and heroism. Similarly, 
The Statler Brothers' 1973 album Carry Me Back includes a song called Whatever Happened to Randolph Scott, which laments the fading popularity of Western films. Even in the realm of comedy, Scott's influence was felt. The 1974 film Blazing Saddles pays homage to him when Sheriff Bart, played by Cleveland Little, tries to rally a crowd by invoking Scott's name. The townsfolk respond with reverence, showcasing their enduring admiration for the actor. Scott's cultural impact extends to literature as well. In Stephen King and Peter Straub's 1984 novel The Talisman, a bar patron is described as resembling Randolph Scott, emphasizing his recognizable and iconic appearance. Musicians also paid tribute to Scott. Leo Kotke's 1994 song Turning into Randolph Scott, Humid Child, reflects his influence on the guitarist's work. And in the realm of comedy once again, Rodney Dangerfield, in a joke told during the 1981 NBC special The Stars Salute the President, humorously mentions how he voted for Randolph Scott, drawing a parallel between Scott's Western film career and Ronald Reagan's involvement in conservative politics. From sports logos to novels, songs, and comedic references, Randolph Scott's presence in popular culture is undeniable. His legacy as a beloved actor and symbol of strength and heroism continues to captivate and inspire even to this day. A Republican Not only did Randolph Scott captivate audiences on the silver screen, but he was also an active participant in the political landscape of his time. A staunch Republican, Scott was even a charter member of the Hollywood Republican Committee, showcasing his commitment to his political beliefs. In 1944, Scott joined the ranks of 93,000 attendees at a massive rally organized by David O. Selznick in the sprawling Los Angeles Coliseum. The purpose of the rally was to rally support for the Dewey Bricker ticket, led by Thomas E. Dewey, who ran against incumbent President Franklin D. Roosevelt in that year's presidential election. The event also aimed to endorse Governor Earl Warren of California, who would later become Dewey's running mate in the 1948 election. It was a star-studded affair, with notable figures such as Cecil B. DeMille, Hedda Hopper, and Walt Disney taking part. Alongside Scott, Hollywood luminaries like Anne Southern, Ginger Rogers, Adolphe Menjou, and Gary Cooper lent their support to the cause. Scott's political involvement didn't end there. He continued to champion Republican candidates in subsequent years. In the 1964 United States presidential election, he threw his support behind Barry Goldwater, who ran as the Republican nominee against incumbent President Lyndon B. Johnson. And when Ronald Reagan made his bid for the California gubernatorial election in 1966, Scott proudly stood by his side. Scott's active participation in politics demonstrated his dedication to the values and principles he held dear. It showcased a different facet of his personality and highlighted his engagement beyond his illustrious film career. By aligning himself with the Republican Party and supporting candidates who resonated with his beliefs, Scott left an indelible mark not only on Hollywood, but also on the political landscape of his time. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.